Hi, everyone, and welcome to this next episode of our Expert Talk Sales. Our topic of the day is sales performance, high performance, and paving a new and healthier path for our sales teams. Our guest today, Andy Carlton, is a sales trainer, coach, and keynote speaker. He's backed by a vast sales career spanning over 20 years and is now dedicated to helping sales organizations pursue their sales goals and truly love their job. So thank you again for joining us today, Andy. Thanks so much for having me. Thanks for the PDA group for putting this together. Thank you. Uh, just as a brief uh, that everybody is aware, Anyone that's listening, if you have any questions, please don't hesitate to comment below underneath this live feed, and we will do our best to address them later on in our conversation. So Andy, we do this every time, so I'll hand it over to you. Uh, it would be great if you could share with us who you are, what you do, and what your company does. But really more importantly, we really wanna know um, how you became the person that you are today. Well, that's a great question. Um, let me just kind of start off with, you know, professionally, you know, I've been in sales and sales leadership for over 25 years. I hate to say that, I hate to admit to it, but you know, there's a lot of wisdom and learning within that 25 years. And, you know, I was successful. I was high, I was really a high performer for many of those years. I helped create a digital agency to a four-time Inc. 5000 company. I led national sales teams one in uh, the SaaS space as well, which which uh, was recognized by the Cisco Innovation Award at the time. Um, but you know, I made a decision to leave corporate America, and I did so for very you know one very good reason. And I, you know, it was actually decided for me. Unfortunately, I had a heart attack, which is pretty serious when you hear when you hear it for the first time. But you know, um, I, I I realized that I'd been part of let's say a toxic and unhealthy sales culture that led to stress and burnout. And I think. Obviously, it's not just you know unique to sales. We all experience it at some point in our lives uh, working in, in corporate America. But you know, as I said, I was working, uh, performing at a high level. But the pressures of you know meeting my own quotas and contribution, managing a team, extensive travel, you know, taking care of my family and my, and my wife who's actually disabled. Um, you know, there was a lot on my plate. So you know that you know fate kind of <laughs> gave me an option at that at that point. So I knew there really had to be a better way where both sales leaders and salespeople could thrive in, in a healthy uh, culture and perform at a high level, really without the grind and burnout that we hear so much about today. And so when I look at salespeople and sales leaders, what I what I hone in on is you know their mindset, right? Their motivators. What are those healthy motivators that are going to keep them going uh, consistently long term? Um, and then I have something called Mojo, which is really about their strengths, right? Leading with your strengths and accentuating those strengths. And then what I call multipliers. These are the things that give you 80% of the return on your energy and your time, right? So we can focus on a particular skill, but it may not give us you know, that return that we need. What are those things that we really truly need to be successful? And so this is something I'm very passionate about, as you know, and you know, because I continue to see the same mistakes being made over and over in companies today. So we're, we're really trying to change that one, one salesperson at a time, one sales organization at a time. Wow. Okay. That was a lot to take in, but just out of curiosity, um, when you've seen this shift and you have yourself have experienced this, how is your definition, um, changed or how is it different to how you used to define sales performance? Well, you know, how I, how I used to define sales performance, um, well, it wasn't me. It was actually, people defined it for me, right? When I first started out in sales many years ago, and I don't want to date myself, but, you know, the culture was very much about, you know, activity, right? It was about doing more and not necessarily being smarter and more strategic about your approach. So that led to a lot of frustration, you know, um, potential burnout, anxiety, and self-doubt, right? So, you know, sales performance was judged based really on how much activity you could do, um, not necessarily how much engagement you were having <laughs> with customers. And so, you know, I think companies, and they still do this today, unfortunately, they rely on the fact that if we do enough outreach to people, our customers and prospects, and we do it enough in a, in a, in in it as many ways as possible, we will hit our numbers eventually, right? So we fall into that kind of 
it's a numbers game, which when people say that I, I cringe, right? It's a numbers game. Um, it, that's not a game I want to play. I'm not sure many salespeople want to play that game either. So, you know, I think we need to change the game. Um, and, you know, I think it is happening and it's something that I'm teaching organizations. Um, but that's, that's how I saw sales when I first started. And that continued for many years. And I think, again, as I said, a lot of organizations continue to make that same mistake. And that's really led by bad cultures and bad bosses that just, you know, are either ignorant um, or don't choose to, you know, make a change. Um, and they see it in their retention. Um, they're losing people right and left. And, and that's not a good thing. So with that how are you defining sales performance to whoever you're coaching and to whoever you're, you know, teaching this new mindset for sales performance with nowadays? Yeah, that's a, that's an awesome question. I mean, to me, sales is a performance, right? I mean, it, in a lot of ways, right? So we have to, we have to show up every day fully. Um, but the role uh, that you're playing is you, right? You're not playing someone else. Like, you know, actors, you know, playing someone else that, okay, but that's not, I mean, some people try to try to um, uh, act like someone else and that never works, right? So we're, true, we're bringing our true selves and our authentic selves to the table every day. And it's really about optimizing who you are as a person to achieve all that you're capable of. Um, and in corporate lingo, you know, the companies look at it, it's, it's, you know, it's the individual and sales team's overall effectiveness and understanding what leads to exceptional results. And there's a lot of organizations that don't understand what, what, what that sauce is. But, you know, I think people that, that win today uh, with, with the high performance sales mindset and succeed at a high level, you know, they don't actually think about, I'm going to win each day. What they're, what they're simply saying is, I believe uh, that things are going to go well for me, right? So, you know, really having that belief and self-confidence in yourself. And that takes time to, to develop. But people can develop it. It really just starts with a, uh, a decision. Do I want to become better? Am I willing to do the things that are required to become better? And that takes commitment, so. We talk about sales enablement on this talk uh, every time, and really they're positioned to be the ones that support our sales representatives and support our sales teams. So how can enablement or enablers out there really help sales leaders in cultivating a healthy and winning sales culture? Yeah, I think, I mean, sales enablement is, um, you know, as I mentioned to you, is, is something we used to call sales and marketing alignment, really aligning, um, you know, teams within your organization so that that you can win, right, as, as, as a team. So, you know, I think for me, you know, when you look at all the things that sales enablement can do, such as, you know, um, sales communications, cross-functional communications with other teams, measuring, reporting, all that great stuff. I think there's a lot there to unpack, but I think, you know, it's really about aligning and partnering with sales and marketing to identify, you know, high value content, uh, training, training salespeople and others how to use those assets with the appropriate tools and, and, and in order to have better conversations with prospects and customers and, and reinforce it. And I'll, I'll, I'll emphasize this with coaching and on-demand training, um, because you know that if, it's, if, if the, if the follow-up is inconsistent from leadership standpoint, it's never going to be fully um, you know, realized and implemented within the organization, right? I mean, we know this from adopting other practices, methodologies, technologies like CRM, you know, people <laughs> just aren't, aren't using it the way they should or using it as much as they should. So it, we, if it can really uh, create more meaningful engagement and conversations with decision makers, that's where, the, that's where the secret sauce is, right? I mean, if we can figure that out, I think sales enablement promises to deliver on that. I think we have a little ways to go to see if that happens, but I think that's, that's what it should be focused on. And I know with you and your group, you're, you're focused on a lot of that. Um, and, um, you know, I think it's an exciting time uh, to be talking about this subject, sales, sales enablement, and how we can really support teams all over the organization to really win more sales ultimately. So. Yep. I, yes, <laughs> I can't agree more. Uh, it's a really exciting time for enablement. It's obviously a bit more mature in the States, but it's exciting to learn and see how we can 
bring this merging and this alignment together of all of these customer facing teams. Um, on the topic of mindset and teaching a new mindset for sales representatives, there's a concept called re regeneration. Um, in sports, it's super important to take time to cool down, rest, regenerate, and make sure that you're ready to conquer the next day or the next goal. So how do you think that we can translate this mindset into our sales teams and really make sure that they're taking the time to be aware of their need to recharge on your own terms and yeah. maybe say no sometimes. Say no, for example, before it gets to a point where it's too late to say no. Yeah, I mean, that's such a great topic. I mean, I, I think certainly the short answer is, is to really create a culture that promotes this, right? You know, when I come, when I, when you onboard me, I want to know, you know, that we're going to, I'm going to have the flexibility and time to actually be able to recharge and reset. Right. And I think that's again, really driven by leadership, but I think, you know, for athletes, for example, as you mentioned, there's always that, that cooling off period. Right. Mm -hmm. When I did football, right. I played football for some time and we would, you know, literally take 20 minutes and do a cool down regimen. So it was not an afterthought, it was actually part of the program, right? So, you know, when I talk about, in, you know, really um, making it part of the culture, we need to do it on purpose, right? We can't just think of it as an afterthought. So, you know, why aren't salespeople doing this? I think we can take some personal responsibility for ourselves and say, how can we do that individually, right? Maybe our company is not stepping up. Um, so how can we do it? I think, you know, just having learned, you know, what works for me over a period of time. I'm not saying what works. I mean, there are other things that can certainly work for other people, but, you know, why aren't we cooling down after a period of, let's say two, two hours of prospecting, right? It's like really focused, right? We're, we're just hammering it. Right. And, and um, you know, that, that, that can be exhausting. Right. So what do, what do we do after that two hour block time? Maybe we step away and, and we go for a walk. Maybe, maybe it's having a conversation with our spouse. Maybe it's, you know, reading a book. I don't know the answer, but I think you need to find what works for you. Um, and, and I think what also has benefited me is putting down the computer and phone at night. You know, I think there's obviously two benefits to that, right? It's saying I'm not available, right? <laughs> you know, I, you know, I leave work where work is and I have my personal life. Um, but also, you know, we know that, you know, scientific studies have shown that blue light is just not healthy for you at night, right? It, it kind of messes up the circadian rhythm and, and your sleep habits. So I think there's a lot of benefit to just doing that. And then maybe saying, listen, um, I'm only doing work. I'm not doing work after six or 7 p.m. at night. It's just, you know, I got to draw the boundaries. So I think, you know, we can we can really step up as salespeople and, and really take control of, of uh, what we do in ourselves defining the boundaries that are going to work for us and our circumstances, because my circumstance is different than yours, right? So you know, as I mentioned, I have, a, I have a wife that has a mess. So, you know, you know, I, there's certain things that I have to do where I can't be working, right? Um, it's not, I, you know, people have kids, right? So they come home from school, they have homework to do. So we have to begin to kind of realize, hey, it, it, you know, we have these personal circumstances that are unique to us. And so we need to work around those, right? So um, so I think as sales leaders, you know, I think on the other side is really just step up and say, how, you know, being able to really know our sales team individually, right, what they need, um, you know, creating that trust early on. So, you know, when it comes time where, you know, we start noticing things are out of whack or, you know, people just aren't, aren't taking the time to, as you say, regenerate, um, we need to step up as sales leaders and, and say, you know, here's what I think you need, you know, maybe take the day off or take the afternoon off or what have you. So, you know, we're all human beings and, and that comes with all of who we are, all of our, all of our weaknesses. Um, and I think it's, you know, it's only then, that, then can we truly understand what, what our team needs, you know, and really kind of creating that relationship up front early on. Um, I think that's so, so important in creating that trust. And, and just knowing what does Susie need versus what Joe needs, right? So we can step up as sales leaders and, and really make those recommendations when we start to notice things are kind of out of whack, so. There's two really important points that I really picked out from what you just said, and that we personally have to take charge and be responsible for the fact that we need to know when it's enough. 
But I think we keep coming up with the word sales team. Like we should also be relying on who we're working with saying like, look, do you need help? I need something from you or like, it's, it's a collaboration between people and sales teams, between sales reps was the first thing. And the second thing I think is it's very important to set your boundaries at work and at home and knowing that those are also two different things that you need to know when it's enough and when to shut down and turn off your phone and your laptop for work, but also at home, like when you need some time for yourself, because that's also super important in order to make sure that you can be there for others as well. Yeah. I almost think that sometimes we're, we're our own worst boss, right? We, we have the, these expectations of ourselves and sometimes um, it's the expectations of what we think others need and want from us. And sometimes those are very, those aren't, those aren't true, right? They're not based in reality. Um, and I think you bring up a good point. It's really, we're working on a team, right? So if yeah. you need something, ask for something, right? Don't be afraid. It doesn't show your weakness. It shows your strength. Mm -hmm. anything, so, yeah. One more thing you were mentioning that sales leaders have this responsibility to see when someone needs to take a break, but how as a sales leader could I also detect or identify if my top sales reps are slowly starting to give up or really like lose heart in what they're doing. Yeah, I think it all gets back to knowing who they are out of the gate right so if we create that relationship up front, I want to know what your personal and professional goals are. I don't, I don't want to know that you want to make, I mean, it's nice. Yeah. You want to make a million dollars this year. Great. Fantastic. I can help you. I can show you how to get there. But, you know, at, I was, you know, I was going to mention earlier on that, you know, money is, money is a very much an external or extrinsic, you know, um, a factor in terms of happiness and fulfillment. Once we reach that 75 K, which studies have shown over a decade ago, we're no more happy, <laughs> you know, making, you know, 150,000. So, you know, there, there are those other kind of what I call uh, intrinsic factors that, that make salespeople much more um, uh, happy and fulfilled, such as autonomy and freedom and those kinds of things. You know, it's like, okay, I made the 75, I can pay my bills. <laughs> What's next type of thing. So, but I think, you know, just, you know, if high performers are, um, you know, just like anyone, you know, if, if, you know, if things are out of whack, as you say, um, you know, again, I think it's a good sales leader is going to know that just because, okay, Bob was acting this way <laughs> for so long, and now I see his behavior has changed. Um, you can obviously see that in um, possibly that person starting later in the day, right? Mm -hmm. um, not communicating with other team members as much as they used to. Um, maybe their activity has gone down, right? They're not making as many connections with customers and prospects. So yeah, I mean, you can look at all that. I, I think that should be pretty glaring. But again, as I said, if you've created that trust and relationship for, up front, you're going to know that Bob is acting out of the norm, right? He's not acting the way he normally acts. So, so I think it's important for us to be as sales leaders aware of what's going on with each individual of our sales team. So, you know, pulling them aside and leading with, with empathy, I think is key, right? We've all been there, right? We've, we've all been in a situation where we've maybe lost the desire and love for something. So I think it's important for those leaders to, um, you know, really bring them back to the love of selling. Why did we get into this business to begin with, right? And I think that's when you can begin to tie in those intrinsic factors, like, you know, serving others, you know, impacting someone's life, you know, not just professionally, but personally. So, you know, there's a lot of, lot of things that selling can do beyond just selling a product or service, right? I think that's, that's short-term thinking, if you will. So, you know, bring them back to the love of selling. Why do we do what we do? And for them, it may be something different than what I believe in, right? So, you know, let's, let, as Simon Sinek would say, let's find out the why, right? Let's find out the why again. Let's revisit that. Attach, attach those reasons to why they got in sales and, and really maybe revisit, you know, maybe those things have changed, right? Maybe when I got into sales, it was different. Now it needs to be about something, you know, um, even more different than it used to be to make it, to make it more exciting for me, make it more, more, more challenging potentially, um, and to help me continue to grow as an individual. So I think all that is, is, um, is very, very important. Yeah, we really have to 
pay attention as leaders to who we have working with us and we need to like you said leave with lead with empathy and and make sure that we're paying attention to any changes that happen within each and every individual that we have working with us speaking of changes um you know we go through different mental shifts as a result of our experiences one of the common experiences being this pandemic which we're still sort of in and we're slowly hoping that we come out of it soon but how do you think that the psychological impact of covid has influenced how salespeople are performing yeah it, it's such a great topic um you know the psychological effects of COVID have been absolutely huge and i think we haven't really even begun to really measure the long-term effects of this um and i will say you know there have been some studies through um an organization called uncrushed about sales burnout and they did a study before the pandemic and they said about 75 percent of salespeople were at or near burnout and that was before the pandemic so you know start to do the um, the research now and i think you'll find something um a bit more disturbing um so i think i think the COVID has had i would say some good effects and and some not so good effects right so i think you know what i saw in in you know having you know, before i left corporate america was that pipelines were severely affected in some cases completely dried up um and so you're like scrambling right it's like okay what do i do i've got nothing in the pipeline um i won't be able to meet my my sales goals my income goals um and so it really has a cascading effect so um and it really depended on certainly the customers that you were serving but we i i do know that you know if you're a salesperson you know kind of selling into the hospitality industry or retail you're in trouble right because you know they're they're all hurt they're closed down they're you know um so you know i think um you know you really had to scramble to say okay how can we reach our customers where they are right because they're going through the, through the same stuff that we are mm -hmm. but it's even more difficult now to actually reach them right it, it used to be i could i could pick up the phone and call the office but now they're on their mobile phones and their mobile phone numbers aren't always published are they <laughs> so you know and and then they're like okay how did you get my my cell phone you know so you know in in a lot of ways we have to be very creative about how we reach people and and maybe we kind of kind of shift that thinking in terms of just the overall tactics strategy might be the same but the tactics can look very different mm -hmm. um and then of course working remotely um i think sales teams generally have worked remotely um i wouldn't i wouldn't say it depends on the organization but a lot of salespeople that uh, sales teams that I talk to, it's a mix, right? Some some have worked remotely for quite some time, others have not, and I think the ones that did not and were forced to um, really um, had to learn a whole new way of coaching and leadership, right? So, you know, we talked about this before the uh, before coming on, but you know, you know, sometimes you know having those weekly calls, those Zoom calls with the sales team initially can be quite fun and interesting but you know after after a while it becomes very exhausting and and like why are we on here you know, it's like you know so so i think leaders have had to kind of throw in an element of fun and you know um and and really ask their their team is this really working right is this is this really effective for our team and having having them tell tell the leaders what they want i think was was very very important and we know that you know people have kids so you know, um, people have our, our, our caregivers, people um, just have other responsibilities. So I think the, the lines that really have become blurred between personal and professional, I think companies really need to understand what the implications of that is and, and really change policies based on it, right? Because this COVID thing is not, it hasn't gone away, right? I mean, we're still with it. So, you know, I think, you know, good high performing organizations realize that those lines have become blurred and really putting more trust in the employees to say, okay, you know, you know what needs to be done. As long as it's done, great. You know, I know you've got kids, I know you've got to do homework. I know you have all these other responsibilities. So, you know, they're they're becoming more empathetic and compassionate, I think, at least the good ones are, about how that should work and, and how it works for their teams. Um, and I think that's evolving. And and as you know, I think the last thing is what we call the great resignation. I mean, there's so many people leaving because they realized they could work from anywhere, right? Mm -hmm. And they realized they could work for companies that were flexible in, in, in how they work. So I think, 
again, as employers and, and sales leaders, we, we need to realize this. If we want to keep and retain good talent, we've got to be able to show them um, that we can that we can work with them as long as they're getting their work done and getting the results. I mean, every, everything, you know, the details don't necessarily matter. So. Yeah, I. Oh, wow. Sorry. Overwhelmed, but sure. Really, it's a big topic. Big topic, yes. And you can cover it from all sorts of angles. But I think one thing that has definitely come out of COVID is that we've had to be much more um, concise and clear, I think, in how we communicate with our teams because there's been there's no there's not much of a distance anymore between work life and personal life like you said because we're working from home we're working probably from the same screen whether like it's something personal or we just need to be more honest and more clear with our coworkers and with our leaders saying like look it's enough now i need to like i'll do what i need to do but now i need to switch off yeah and i think i'll just add um you know <laughs> I have a funny story. I used to work with a, a gentleman who, um, you know, when we were kind of forced back in March of 2020 to work from home, he didn't have a workspace, right? So literally he was working out of his closet. I, I, not, I do not kid you. I, when I called him and got him on a Zoom call, he was sitting in a dark closet. And I was like, oh my God, you know, it's like, don't you have anywhere else to work? And he's like, no, because, you know, I, I live with someone and they're working out in, in, in this, this common area. So you know, I don't think people were prepared. Uh, they were just kind of thrown into the situation. So I, my, my thing is you've got to find a place where you can actually do the work, where you can focus, mm -hmm. um, call it your workspace, right? And that's something you protect, right? When you're working, you're working in this area, you're not doing other things, right? So I think that's so important to, to really keep the focus and commitment that you need to have in this whole idea of sales performance, right? We, if we're going to perform at a high level and show up every day uh, fully, we've got to have that dedicated space to work from so yeah i also have a small corner in my bedroom now that counts as my workspace because okay. it's a bit tight for space in my yeah. apartment uh, i just want to be cautious of time so what advice do you have for any salesperson or sales leader listening on the subject of having the appropriate mindset and approach towards sales performance now yeah, I think my biggest advice, and I won't be long-winded on this, is that it takes work, right? Um, not many people want to hear that, right? They want to take the path of least resistance. But, you know, it, it's a skill to think a certain way, right? It, it's not just going to happen to you, right? Especially if you're more prone to negative thinking and negative mindset. You really have to work on it, right? So, um, and we have, we have all that historical baggage that blocks us, that we bring to the situation. And so it takes... As I said, you know, revisiting this whole idea of self-awareness, you know, really being honest with yourself about what, what thoughts are preventing you from taking the right action in your life to achieve what you say you really want. And, you know, um, and then really deciding, you know, am I going to make the commitment to show up every day to achieve it? And that's that that's really it. If I could summarize it, that would be it. So Re like take the moment to reflect for yourself what you need and what you can achieve every day that you show up. Absolutely. Basically. All right, Andy, uh, thank you again so much for your time and your insights. Is there anything left you don't think that we've uncovered or covered yet? Well, I mean, as I said, sales performance, high performance, something I could, I could um, pine on all day. Um, and, you know, I give talks about it constantly because I think it's such an important topic. And I, as I say, it's not about the grind. It's not about, you know, uh, being Superman or Superwoman. It's really about a, a, a different way of approaching sales that is smarter, more thoughtful, based on healthy motivation and healthy sales culture. Um, I will say, you know, um, I'm, I'm a big believer in personal development. I know one of your questions was, you know, what, what I follow. Simon Sinek uh, is a great, um, you know, authority on, on these things, you know, really defining your why. Seth Godin is good because he talks about acting like a non-commodity. And what better subject to really talk about with other salespeople than being a non-commodity, right? So how do you differentiate yourself? And then the last one is really Atomic Habits by James Clear, which is really helping you define what that, what your, what those habits, um, um, you know, what those habits are that really give you the maximum return. 
um, for your day. And I think those are three areas that, you know, for as far as resources I would look at, but um, yeah, I mean, I hope that helps our, our, our uh, listeners today. And uh, certainly if anyone wants to contact me, um, they can reach me on LinkedIn. That's the best way to do it. Um, you can email me at andy at andrewcarltoncoaching.com to book a call. Or if you want to get my no fluff sales performance content, you can sign up as well. Thanks again, Andy. Um, thank you, everyone, for listening. Uh, thank you for having this conversation with me. And for everyone that's listening, please tune in to our next expert talk that's up and coming. And if you have a moment to spare and you're not yet too tired for the day, check out our website, pdagroup.net. Thank you. Thank you.